here. Corn army. Sometimes on stage, I look at it, I'm like, I kind of, like, when I'm playing, I go, man, I'm going to be bummed when this all goes away because it's like a big, like, family out there, you know? I look at all those people, and I'm like, and I, like, I don't ever want to take advantage of it, you know? I just, like, feel, wow, man. That's why we're always so cool with all our fans and try to be cool because Cause we appreciate. We know it. where we started, yep. and we know where we're at, and we don't forget you guys. The Californian five-piece known as Corn burst onto the hard rock scene in the mid-1990s. Trouncing in their wake the big hair and spandex image of 80s metal, Corn would bring hard rock back to the kids by way of hip-hop culture in what we now know as new metal. Even today, after five studio albums under their belt, Corn are still pushing the creative envelope eager to try new sounds and expand their ever-increasing body of musical influences. Uh, and look, there's a little bit of new stuff in there, but we're just trying to really get riff-oriented, where it's just about the music and not so much relying on extra effects and sounds and stuff. So it's kind of, you know, we just try our hardest to experiment and come up with new, fresh sound and stuff. Corn have always cared deeply about their fans, tirelessly reinventing new ways of keeping them informed and supplied with new music. We're trying to shoot for an album every year. It seems like bands stop doing that. Um, it seems like it takes five years between albums and that just sucks. It just it's, gives the fans music to listen to and keeps them interested, I think. So if we can pull it off, we're going to try. Above all, their success has come through a deep-rooted passion for what they do and what they stand for. We're just like, you know, doing our thing, what we want to do and what we love to do. And everybody's just digging on it. Corn have changed the way music is made and are now considered one of the world's greatest rock bands. But how did the boys from Bakersfield, California achieve such global domination? Times have changed though. You know, we were in like the 70s, it's, it, this is the 90s. Our kids didn't grow up like with guns and shit. <laughs> Basically, I think times have Different changed. Different time. Different times, when we grew up, we were just all products of, our parents were in the 70s and 80s, and now it's just a different time. So kids are different now. There's a lot more problems out there today. It's not gonna be another like 15 years before we have the, even our kids are like old enough to, and by that time, who knows? Yeah, it'll be different then. The world's probably going to be over. The first thing that hits you about Bakersfield is how much nothing you have to drive through to get there. A small town surrounded by a huge island of fields, plonked in an enormous ocean of desert wasteland. The wild lights of LA are only a two-hour car hop, but for a bored, transportless teenager, it might as well be the moon. Three things dominate Bakersfield, or B-Town as it's known to the locals. The first is agriculture. Drive 10 miles out of Bakersfield in any direction and you will be in a field. Oil is the next. The town has a permanent smell that has you worried each time you light a cigarette. And finally, there's religion. Churches are more popular than burger bars. And in America, that's saying something. Dubbed Nashville West in the 60s, Bakersfield's place as the Californian country and western mecca did little to inspire the town's young. Throw in the dominant oil, agriculture and religion, and you arrive at an environment guaranteed to screw up anyone under the age of 35. A town big enough to get into trouble, but small enough for everyone to hear about it. To understand the uniqueness of Korn, we have to look at the extraordinary individual members of the band. As a young boy, one Jonathan Davis quickly learnt how the rigours of constant touring could rip a family apart. His dad, Rick Davis, was a professional musician, spending vast amounts of time away from home, flogging the well-trodden US country and blues circuit. Ironically, Rick was to count Reggie Fieldy Arvizu's dad amongst his travelling bandmates. In his first early years, Jonathan spent a miserable time being shuffled back and forth between relations, stepmothers, aunts and uncles. 
In these first important years of his life were planted the seeds of insecurity, doubt and distrust. These would later grow into anger, hate and rage in his early teens. Jonathan's belief in guardian angels, aroused by his own paranoid encounters with dead grandmothers and great uncles, were rammed home by an astrologer aunt. He grew up seeing ghosts, almost becoming one himself when he suffered a nearly fatal asthma attack at the age of five. Death was always part of the youngster's life, an impression he would carry through into adulthood. Trapped in a pre-teen B-Town nightmare, one of Jonathan's only positive emotional outlets was music. As well as touring, his father ran a music store off Kern Road. Jonathan was encouraged from an early age to play with a bizarre and eclectic range of instruments that crammed the shop from all corners of the globe. Here was a real link to a real world, beyond the fields and dunes of his prison. Jonathan would often borrow instruments, persuading his school music teachers to show him the ropes. Once a few basics had been absorbed by the hungry mind, the young Davis would work out the rest for himself. In this manner, he became experienced in all kinds of musical techniques, including the violin, piano, clarinet, double bass, and famously, his beloved bagpipes. And all by the remarkable age of 12. In the late 80s, and still a boy, Jonathan had yet to meet both James Monkey Schaefer and David Silveria. The two were well aware of the former's existence, however, as they had both dated his sister. Whilst Davis kept himself to himself, some of the other eventual members of the band were already kicking their heels and jamming together. With little else to do except get wasted, Bakersfield supported a surprisingly large music scene at the time. Like any isolated town, the kids had to look towards themselves for musical inspiration. Out of this melting pot, through pure enthusiasm and naivety, would emerge an extraordinary range of bands who would change music forever. At, at the time, Bakersfield was a real interesting blend of, you had, you had the punk rockers hanging out with the uh, uh, with the club kids hanging out with the hippies, hanging out with uh, you know the, the metalheads, Hessians we call them, and and everyone seemed to get along uh, pretty well. And at the time, we had a pretty active uh, underground scene. The new metal sound that was to stem from bands like Corn, Cradle of Thorns, Video Rome, Adema, and Orgy was more a factor of isolation and ignorant bliss stemming from Bakersfield's location rather than a calculated commercial assault on the music business. The music sounded different because the kids knew no better. There have grown up many legendary myths about the antics of teenage life in Bakersfield at the time. These include stories of wild debauchery at infamous field or kegger parties. Yeah, at the, at the time uh, in Bakersfield, I guess the thing to do uh, was to go to field parties. These, these uh, keggers out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, those, those were, were pretty notorious.